Okay, welcome. Uh, very happy uh, today to have uh, Dr. Uh, Larry Paxton coming all the way from uh, J uh, not JPL, uh, APL, uh, to visit us and give us uh, this uh, talk, call him. Uh, so Larry received his uh, PhD in Astrophysical, Planetary, and Atmosphere Sciences from the University of uh, Colorado. So he has a deep root here at Boulder. And uh, so he's uh, currently a group supervisor of the Geospace and Earth Science Group at uh, APL, the Applied Physics Lab of uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he's also a faculty at the Johns Hopkins uh, Water Institute. Uh, he has worked on the development of uh, novel instruments for uh, uh, low-cost space missions, monitoring the upper atmosphere and climate. Uh, upper atmosphere also worked on atmosphere modeling. Uh, climate and societal impacts, uh, and support for national security missions. And uh, he has been a PI and co-PI on very uh, high-profile upper atmosphere missions, such as uh, GUI, uh, the DMSP SUSI and SUSI Light, Cerebus, Gaia, and also project scientists on uh, Canary. Canary? Uh, he has been participated in many other space missions, such as the Pioneer Venus, uh, and also the uh, uh, U.S. Navy raids on the uh, uh, space station. Uh, on the service side, he's the president-elect of the Space Physics and uh, Aronomy section of AGU, and uh, also serves as the uh, executive board, on the executive board of uh, Energy, Earth, Energy, Sustainability, and Health Institute, also at Johns Hopkins. Uh, today, he's going to share his uh, vision uh, of the UV uh, remote sensing of atmosphere. Thanks. It's great to be here. Hey, so, um, you know, it's, for me, I don't give very many talks about what I've done. They're usually about what I can do for the person who's listening because I pitch a lot of things to sponsors. So what I want to do is, aside from, you know, everybody gives AGU talks, and I give a lot of AGU talks and stuff, but what I want you to do is, uh, hopefully you'll see some things in here in the data that I'm going to show you, and think about the way that I'm presenting the data to think, well, this is something that I think I can use. This mic seems to be cutting in and out, is it? Or is that just me? Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. How's that? Let's try and see if it works. Okay. Well, let me know if it seems to be cutting in and out. Um, so again, so the takeaway is two things. There's a lot of data that we have available. Now, the reason why it's only recently available is because only recently we have the Air Force to okay unlimited distribution of this data. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight into that, illustrate some of the work we've done, but there's a lot more that can be done with this data. And I want to sort of explore with you some of the ideas we have. The other thing is that when we look at the opportunities for missions that are going to be coming online in the next few years, which there aren't too many, uh, one of the things I want to remind you is that I'm interested in finding out of what kind of things you would like to propose to do. Because we want to form teams for the next round of MOOs and SMEXs. So that's part of why I'm here too. So I'm going to show you one particular kind of instrument. Um, it's a UV spectrograph, but we have a whole suite of things that we can do. So when you look at this, thing is, don't think about, well, what would it take to fly just that particular instrument? But what do I really want to do? What are the scientific questions I really want to answer? So let's take a look at this and see, is this guy going to go? No. Huh. Well, that's always interesting, isn't it? I wonder why it isn't working. Well, it is what it is. So I'll stand over here and see. Yeah, okay, so he, this is a familiar picture, right? We've all seen this. So now, what are the kind of lessons you want to draw from this? I've talked about this before. The, the lessons you really want to take away from this is we understand the big picture as being made up of a bunch of little pictures. And we have very few instruments that actually give us the global view of the processes that are occurring in the upper atmosphere. And the key thing that's happened in just the last, say, decade or so is this realization is really important to understand the forcing from below. So we're moving into this field where we want to understand the whole atmosphere system and its connection to outside. And we have the tools now that are available to that. So what are the, con the frontier mission kind of things that we want to look at? Well, they're the meteorological driving of the IT system, 
and how does the lower atmosphere drive the geospace environment, uh, plasma neutral coupling, um, multi-scale global response, and atmosphere ionosphere magnetosphere interaction. Now these are some of the things I'm going to specifically talk about in this talk. There's also this other question that hasn't got a whole lot of attention, this planetary um, change. How does the planetary environment change over time? So the way it would work, of course, is we've got CO2 that's being produced, um, and it's going to change the radiative balance of the lower thermosphere, the amount of methane that gets past the tropopause and into the upper atmosphere where it's oxidized, more water vapor. We see that as PNCs. We also see that in the total hydrogen budget. We get many years of hydrogen data, but I'm not going to talk about that either. This thing's really annoying me. It's not annoying you guys. Is it okay? Okay. So let's go on. That's okay. Well, it's okay. It's okay. So uh, I just want to remind you that designing a system, a sensor system, is straightforward. What we really need is to set up a clear set of things you want to measure, the scientific questions. That's always the starting point. It's not like, hey, I have this sensor in the box. So what I'm going to show you is the kind of things that we can measure. And then what you want to do, what I want you guys to do, is say, okay, so if I can measure these things, what are the questions I can address with that? I have a list of my own questions that I want to, I'm particularly interested in. But like I said, I want to see what you have to say. And then, so there are lots of these sensor designs that are available. I have everything from spectrographic imagers, and I'll tell you a little bit about one of those, to wide field of view cameras. Now, I talk about ultraviolet remote sensing. The reason why is because in the far ultraviolet, the disk of the Earth is black. It means we don't see down below about, in high alignment up, about 85 or 80 kilometers, and then most of the other wavelengths about 100 kilometers. So you don't see any of that background. So you can look straight down, and you can see the aurora then day or night, for example. So you get full coverage, and um, if the sensor is properly designed. Now the other thing is we're going to soon have icon and gold providing data for us. Now uh, we do need more of this kind of data. And right now, the Air Force DMSP SUSE program is the only sensor providing a rural imagery from space. And I'll show you some images from it. But the emphasis here is on DMSP. The Air Force is at the end of the DMSP program. And it's not clear what's going to take its place. So we have this limited time on the resource. And so what things are going to fill the gap after DMSP goes away? Because right now, we have the J5 sensor data, which is the particle data, not routinely available since March of 2014, no money. IES data, not routinely available for many years because no money. SUSE data, only available because we have another activity going that's supporting it. Question? Oh, Defense Meteorological Satellite Program. It's an Air Force program. I, it's, it's probably sprinkled with a lot of jargon, so if I say something, please ask a question. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, uh, we, so why do we study geospace? Now, there's two different audiences for why we do this. There's the basic research community, right? We want to understand things. And one of the things I'd like to develop as a theme in conversations outside of this meeting, or outside of this talk, is what can heliophysics say about exoplanets and the evolution of uh, other so solar systems? Because that's something I think we need to make a connection to. Now, um, in terms of what we call space weather, and what, what um, really, that's a term that's sort of used very loosely about uh, what it actually means. And it can mean everything from the small scale variability about the mean to particular applications to technological systems. But what are the, one of the things that people particularly care about are the performance gaps that need to be addressed so that our understanding of space weather can be addressed. The way that a lot of the customers look at this is they want to be able to tell the difference between natural phenomena and artificially produced phenomena. And so that means you have to have a characterization. So what are the, error, the range of phenomena you're going to actually see? And so uh, what is that minimum irreducible set of measurements and models required in order to operate assuredly in the space environment? That's what most of DOD and the intelligence community cares about. Okay, so now just to start off with what is far ultraviolet remote sensing, what can it tell you? This is an early experiment, this was on Apollo 16. There's a camera back here, it's actually fairly big, it's about waist high, this is sort of perspective. That's the camera back there, and it took a picture that looked like this. This is with an electronographic camera, it accelerates electrons onto an electron-sensitive piece of film, and then they carted the film back for development. 
And what you see in this picture is all the phenomena that I'm going to be talking about, except for the things I'm not going to talk about. Okay? So as things are, you know, there's stars here. We use stars for calibration. So the instruments I'm talking about are calibrated to better than 10%, which is difficult to do. The geochronal hydrogen, that's one of the things that responds to this planetary environmental change. We got data all the way back to 2002. Okay. Um, stars that are viewed in occultation, like here, they give you profiles in the atmosphere. The limb profile itself tells you about the composition and structure of the atmosphere and temperature. Aurora, the equatorial arcs, which are driven by the, the, uh, the equatorial ionization anomaly, which is caused by the upwelling of ionized uh, gas over the equator. And then you can see the night glow here is on the limb. That gives you limb profiles as well. And then, of course, the southern aurora. And you can see the asymmetry in the aurora, even in this very coarse picture. So, I'm sorry. Pretty broad. It went all the way from um, about 1150, because I think it had a uh, lithium fluoride um, window on the detector, to um, probably about 18, or you know, the photocathode's fallen off pretty fast, probably 1650 or so angstroms. So 115 nanometers to 160 nanometers. And of course, the human eye sees about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. So one of the things I want to explore with you guys, since, since HAO is, is big on, and NCAR, UCAR is big on models, this is a thing I don't know a whole lot about, is you know, how do we gauge the performance of the models? And one of the things they're most sensitive to, the biggest challenge in models, is getting the boundaries right. And I'll tell you about what boundaries mean to me. But there are things like, so, and you can see these in the data. Like, you know, is the aurora in the right place? Is the location with an evolution of that boundary right? What's the conduction pattern look like? The conductivities. And one of the things we do is we deduce conductivity profiles. Not just the conductance, but we produce maps of conductivity and conductance. Okay? And the equatorial ionization anomaly the location of the crest, of course, that responds to the, the electrodynamics, the magnitude of the crest, responds to things like solar inputs and time. The asymmetry is driven by the meridional component of the neutral wind. And then the longitudinal variation, of course, is driven by tidal influences. And there are also small scale things. Composition signatures, I'm going to give you an example of what happens with ODN2. And then density and temperature, we have a database of limb observations that give us um, data that we don't otherwise have. And of course, one of the things that's really interesting is these phenomena that are related to gradients like the occurrence of ionospheric bubbles. They're driven by the rayleigh kähler instability. And the question is, what is the actual mechanism for seeding these bubbles? Are the conditions always there? And we just, or are they sometimes there and we only need the seed and, and the right conditions? Or what actually causes these guys to occur? Now, um, so this is what you could measure in the far ultraviolet. This is a big table. It's got all kinds of stuff in here. But you can see, like, each one of the signatures that you see in a particular wavelength band is related to particular things that you can do in, a, uh, in an area. Like in the auroral zone, we get maps of proton precipitation, which actually are both Q and E naught, and they tell you where the, the B2I boundary, for example, is. Um, we can get from the night side limb and the day side limb, we can get column H. Now, I'm going to give you examples of what we do with these other guys in just a second. Thing to remember when I show you pictures is you're getting quantitative as well as qualitative information. So on the website, there's all of this data is there. There's lots of pictures, but all of the numbers are there too. Every number, every quantity we drive has an error bar associated with it and a calibration factor associated with it as well. So you know what how good they are. So let's go back to this little picture. So remember there are all these phenomena that are sort of put together to give you a, a total view of what's going on. Well, the red circles here show you the kind of things that we can do with far ultraviolet remote sensing. You see why I'm so excited about it, right? And I'm just trying to introduce the topic to you, what we can do. Because there's a lot of different things that you can do with this. So now, what we've been doing, or what I've been doing, uh, even basically uh, since I did my PhD thesis back in a long time ago, back, or, well, anyway, we won't go back that far, but the thing is, I've been doing UV remote sensing, and we've got a series of instruments. We're looking at the last launch of DMSP F20 in 2016, so next year. No idea what's going to follow that up, follow on with that. A lot of people have done have depended on the data from the J sensor, the Aurora uh, 
energetic particle uh, spectrograph. Um, we've got SUSE instrument and we've got um, the IES instrument. The instrument I'm going to tell you about, show most of the data from, is basically what's called a scanning imaging spectrograph. What that means is there's a mirror that directs the field of view back and forth across the disk and up on the limb. The important thing is it's up on the limb as well, so every time as you're going around the orbit, you're getting a limb profile and then you're getting disk imaging information. And then you go back and forth. You also get the entire spectrum. So you have to get all of the wavelength information. Now on DMSP, they only gave us 3,814 bits. Not bytes, not megabits, bits. So we had to cram that into these things we call colors and that's how we extract all the information. But you don't have to do that. So here's the pattern. So what I want you to think about when I show you these pictures is, here's an orbit, we're in low Earth orbit, about 830 kilometers. It takes about 102 minutes to go around the orbit and we're making a scan pattern back and forth and they overlap. And then here would be the next orbit. So this is an orbit, it's, it's ascending node orbit in this particular picture. So let's look at ODAN2. You guys, I think everybody's familiar, heard about ODAN2 as a tracer of dynamics. So let's take a look at it. So here's the reason to do this. Um, this. So the reason I showed you that picture of building it up is we start here during the day and we're building up scan after scan after scan. Here's the universal time. It progresses this way. So time is increasing this way. It takes us a day to build up this image. But what we see is that as before the storm, this is sort of a characteristic distribution of O to N2. The reason why we want to look at this is this is a marker of the transport processes. Because at high latitudes, the O is going to be blown up by heating. It's going to descend at mid-latitudes. What we want to see is how does that change in response to our world inputs, the coupling of the, uh, the ionosphere and the thermosphere to magnetospheric forcing. So here's an image. This is the next time. We're a little bit further along in this storm event, superstorm. And we see that as time went along, we started to see there was a stronger and stronger upwelling, a downwelling at mid and low latitudes, and then that continued on. And now we see an asymmetry in the response. Notice here in the northern hemisphere, it's still the response, it's sort of recovering back to normal, but then the southern hemisphere response, highly asymmetric, has taken on, you know, uh, started to change the circulation pattern. Now, and then it sort of recovers back to normal. So what we're seeing is this is a picture from a paper by Ray Robel from maybe 30 years ago. This is that simple picture of what the circulation pattern is. Now when we look at O to N2, we're looking way down here, down at the bottom of the thermosphere. And what we're seeing is then a sensitive indicator of what's happening in this global circulation pattern. And we can see it as season, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so, so on uh, the O to N2 measurement that I'm seeing, what happens is these are photoelectrons. They're created by um, solar photons coming in, ionizing it, and they create it with, they, like say if you have uh, 304, it has enough energy to create an electron with significant energy and ionize the gas. That collides with other things and excites them and we see the glow. Yes, yeah, because you know the solar spectrum, the process is pretty straightforward. Above, below about 300 kilometers is uh, a local deposition problem. There's transport above it. All the submission is occurring down low. But it's an interesting question. I'll show you, we'll come to a theme to close this out in a little bit later on about how you would actually use this in models. Um, so, so let's take another example. So that was a super storm. So there were huge depletions at high latitudes. So this is something that happens during uh, during the extended solar minimum. And there are dozens of cases like this. So again, this is before the storm, and you see we're going to go from this day up through here, and you see that this depletion on the 21st through the 22nd, this depletion here becomes actually quite big. In fact, there's a 70% decrease at mid-latitudes and a 50% increase at low latitudes in, in terms of the O to N2 ratio. So what's happening is that this, because the density of the atmosphere has changed, and also the structure of the ion neutral drag has changed, I'm imagining, you see a different behavior here. Now notice what he's talking about stuff that shows a color bar. Well, the thing is, it's interesting about this, that this, you might say, that sharp decrement there is just an artifact of the color bar chosen. 
But the O to N2 ratio shows this very, very steep decrease. So the question is, if we think back to that cartoon picture of the circulation pattern, do the models, do the GCMs actually get the circulation right? And I would assert they have a lot of trouble with that. And so this is one of those areas that might be potentially very rich. So the thing I was trying to point out was you don't need solar maximum to see these effects. You can do it at solar minimum. And that also eliminates some of the other drivers. So we're thinking about this data set as something that's enabling you to reduce some of the complexity. What do I mean by that? If I look from year to year at the same day, I'm sampling at the same local time with time. If I look, I can look at seasons, I can look at, say, spring and autumnal, uh, you know, the solstices and the equinoxes at different times of the year and different times of the solar cycle and see what happens. And I'll give you an example of that in just a little bit. So, again, here's another slice through this. This is very characteristic of the kind of behavior you see with sharp decrement in the ODEN 2. And you see it's sort of a universal thing. Now, uh, March 2015, we had a fairly large disturbance, geomagnetic storm. And so just for fun, let's take a look at this. So here's what happened. March 17th, uh, the uh, KP got up to 9. I just use this for sort of cartoon kind of things, you know. It's just to say it's a big storm. And then it took a couple of days to come back to normal. So let's look and see what happened. Well, you know, one of the things we see is before the storm, there's this characteristic distribution this time of year. The, uh, sort of a decremented ODN2 at high latitudes and an increase down here at mid-latitudes because, again, the sun is shining on this particular part of the sky. That's how we see, or, or the disk, so that's what we see. One of the new products we're looking at is looking at NO, nitric oxide, because when we look down in this particular band, we're seeing down to through the nitric oxide layer, down to about 90 kilometers. So we get the total column nitric oxide. Now, why is that important? Nitric oxide peaks at about 105 kilometers, so now we've got something that's sampling at about 180 kilometers, what the circulation pattern looks like. Now, and that's the ODN2, then we have something that samples down at 105, but it's also driven by the energetics, the energy inputs at high latitudes. And so what we can do is we can see as the storm evolves over time, and we see again this characteristic decrease in the ODN2 rate, a, a ratio at high latitudes, and then again, sort of an asymmetric response. Even this was again March, so this is equinox. So we're still seeing sort of an asymmetric response, but it's much more symmetric than we saw in November. And then we can compare that to the increase in nitric oxide. So now this is something we haven't done much with the models on. And this is a product, this nitric oxide product is one we're in development on. But I think this is a, a key insight into the dynamics and the energetics of the thermosphere. And so now it sort of will eventually return to normal. Now, here's the kind of thing that you can do. It turns out there were two storms, two uh, St. Patrick's Day storms, one in 2013 and one in 2015. It's almost like a natural experiment, right? So do these two guys give you a different response? Look, here's DST. It drops down. It's not as deep a storm or sharp, and it doesn't have this uh, quite as deep a prolonged recovery, but it's almost the same kind of recovery time. So one of the questions is, are we able to reproduce these two cases? Can we have self-consistent model inputs across these two events that reproduce it? Because you know there's lots of knobs on the GCMs. So without twisting them you know, this way and that way incompatibly, can you get it? And so let's see what the response looks like. Well, see, again, there was the 2015 storm was a bigger one. And you can sort of see in this color picture that the depletions were bigger. And there are a lot of similarities from day to day. I just lined them up day to day. But you can see this storm, the 2013 storm, showed a larger depletion at southern latitudes than the 2015 did. So why is that? Well, there may be subtleties, but this is the kind of thing I'm coming to you guys to ask you. Why do we see that? Okay. Now, let's be honest here for a second. So what we do is, because we're looking at um, atomic oxygen emissions at 1356, it's due to the recombination of O plus with electrons. These are the thermalized electrons in the ionosphere, recombines, and you get emission at 1356, 135.6 nanometers. And what we can do is we can use this to deduce a lot of properties. Um, one of the things we can do, and I'll get to that in just a second, is besides doing limb profiles, we can actually do 3D tomography of the ionosphere. 
Uh, one of the things we want to understand is what's the small scale variability in the ionosphere. And I'll show you in a second why that's important to some people. Okay, so one of the big questions is uh, there are instabilities in the ionosphere. This is the Sultan equation, but this is the uh, growth rate for the instabilities. There's some of these things that we can measure, but not everything. But one of the questions is, can we predict the onset of these instabilities? And so we have a database of things. So what does one of these instabilities look like? Here's one of those swaths of data. This is one, of the, one strip from one of the Susies. Remember, we had four of these guys flying. And these, uh, these brighter features here, this, this and this, are these upwellings in the ionosphere that's created by the E-cross-V drift that lifts the, lifts the ions that were created on the day side. They rotate through to this night side. They're falling down along the magnetic field lines. And there's a peak, a crest in the anomaly on either side of the magnetic equator. Okay? And so inside here, these little thin stripes here, these guys are, um, these detailed structures here, these are bubbles in the ionosphere. They're created by that Rayleigh-Taylor instability, the birth rate equation I just showed you before. Now what you can do is you can now take slices through these, and I'll show you how we do the tomography. But you can take the slices at different altitudes, and what you can see is there are holes in the ionosphere. You say, well, what does that matter? What does it matter if there are holes or instabilities or turbulent regions in the ionosphere? Well, it turns out it matters a lot. The reason is that we have gross scale morphologies that are driven by things or that are given to us, and one of them is the, ion the International Reference Ionosphere model. It turns out that on a particular day, it really looks like this. Uh, you can see there's a lot of structure in here that's not duplicated. This is an example for 11 megahertz, the transmission of 11 megahertz signal at various angles through this ionosphere. And you can see some of the ray paths that didn't make it or did make it through before don't make it through. They're reflected internally. And so this has a profound implication on what happens. So uh, there was an event that we wrote a paper on space weather about the Battle of Takragar in March 2002, where we used GUVI data to look at this, and we looked at the impact of line of sight impingement of bubbles during COM, where they're trying to uh, communicate. What happened was that uh, because they, they weren't able to warn the quick reaction force that uh, this mountain was held by opposing forces, six more people died. And this was actually picked up by Science Magazine as one of the top 10 stories. The, the commander of this quick reaction force is a, a really great guy named Nate Self. He came to visit me. It was one of the high points of my life to meet that guy. And that's the kind of stuff that space weather is really all about. Um, so now, what we're trying to do, though, is put together this picture that nests the global thing with the big picture questions. I'm glad that wasn't five minutes because I was always totally if it was five minutes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, that's right. In fact, and to not go too far off the tangent, we can talk about this more. One of the things I've been looking at is um, our detectability of small scale irregularities at mid latitudes. And they're actually far more prevalent than um, you might have thought. And we can go into a longer discussion about why some of these things are not seen in GPS TEC measurements, especially when they're translated into vertical TEC. But I think that that's part of the reason that some of this stuff hasn't been observed. And so one of the things we want to see is, do the models predict this? Are they able to capture this? They're related to MSTIDs, but this particular thing is we see some of these bubbles last for a long time into the night. It's turbulence. Part of the thing is that it's a question of margins of per calm. During this battle, there was a lot of, uh, there was jamming, the, uh, the radio signals are encrypted, and there's, they use uh, frequency hopping to you know, move the, the comm channels back and forth. There's a lot of other complications, so what happens is it doesn't preclude it, but you move it down so you're in the region where you no longer are able to establish secure comms. And that, I think, is what happened. Yeah, it's a, a way of, yeah, so yeah. So what happens is they're almost like, uh, the way I always look at them is, uh, you remember all the old-fashioned lava lamps? 
you know. I, there would be a, you would heat it up, and then there would bubble would sort of warm and go up to the top. That's almost exactly what simulations of these plasma bubbles look like. Inside, or at least on the surface, we believe that there's a, a whole bunch of, of small scale turbulence, and that's what affects the signal. Inside, there's, so there's really two issues here, the turbulence and the impact on, this, on the signal itself, but also the change in the, in the rate path that it does. So there's another class of people that are very interested in that particular problem. So part of the thing we want to do is we've got sort of, we want to go from this large scale IT variables to these mesoscale and intermediate scale, and there's a whole class of people that really are interested in these really small scale things. So those are the challenges for us. Now, Aurora imagery, uh, just to remind you, that the Gooby website is goobytimed.jhuapl. Uh, it's, it's changed from goobie.jhuapl. And Susie, so you can look there. I built the first one of these guys in uh, probably 92. We live, delivered the last one. We started in 92. We delivered the last guy in 96. First was in 94. And um, they were all delivered by 97, the beginning of that. And then the first launch was in 2003. And you can see that these guys, the interesting thing I want to point out is they're in different local solar times. So we have one that's about 4 a.m., 4 p.m., one at 5.30-ish, one at about 7. This guy was at 8 uh, or 6 p.m. And then this last one will probably be about um, 20 hours uh, local solar time. And then, you know, as I said before, what's going to happen next? We don't know. So remember I said, showed that picture of one of those swaths? So let's take a look at a day's worth of data. And then I could string together a whole bunch of these in an ad hoc movie. This is a response time. Again, the, the um, beginning of the day is right about here. Time is going this way. So this is one day starting here, going around like this. And what you can see is there's a separation of the bubble sort of or the equatorial arcs changes. And at the end of the day, during the end of this part here, the separation of the arcs has been decreased and sort of collapsed. There are bubbles in through here. And the question is, so why aren't there any bubbles here? And is it more than a coincidence that what's happened is the aurora started at just around then. There was an increase in auroral activity. So this is the very next day. And you can see, again, this link between the, the occurrence of the aurora and the suppression of bubbles. See, in this pass here, just an hour and a half before, there are bubbles. And then later on, there aren't any. There aren't any. And then it recovers. And so you can do this kind of thing. So you can sort of see. There's not only is there a question of persistence of these features, but the growth and the change in them. Now, one of the things you can do if you have four of these guys that are separated by small increments in local solar time, what that means is that if I look up and I'll see one of these pass overhead, say at 4 p.m., two hours later, another one pass overhead. And uh, about an hour later, another one pass overhead. Half hour later, another one pass overhead. And so what I can do is start to string these together to investigate questions like how do these bubbles evolve over time? Because that comes back to the fundamental physics of this. Now remember, each one of these guys is generating you know, a small amount of data, about uh, 26 megabytes per day. We've got five of those guys, so you imagine there's terabytes of this stuff, so I'm encouraging you to help me look at this data. So what we can do, too, is we can start to parse out what's happening. So each one of these scans, remember the scans are going back and forth. So if I was to look, you know, if you're at the, the SUSE instruments are always mounted upside down. So it's like I'm really looking here. So this is the Earth here. My scan pattern is going like this. But the cool thing about this instrument is it has a 12 degree field of view this way. So it's really a big swap. It's moving back and forth. And so we get overlapping scans. These scans, this overlap in the lines of sight, enables you to do this tomographic inversion. So you're able to apply that grid of intersecting lines of sight to create a data cube. And this is a three-dimensional representation of the ionosphere. And you can do this, oops, sorry. You can compare this to one that just happened just a few uh, minutes later, in fact. Now, the thing to bear in mind, remember, this is IRI. This is that climatological ionosphere. You see there's the crest in the anomaly. And you can see not only is the, the asymmetry different here, but the occurrence of the bubbles in this particular guy. It's not recorded. And so you're able to take these cubes, each one of these guys, and slice it. Now, remember, I'm just going to show you some of bubbles because people care about bubbles. But this technique works when the ionosphere does not have bubbles in it, too. Okay? So you get HMF2, NMF2, 
you get tilts, you get gradients on the bottom side, and all the rest of this stuff. So those are the things that are in that sorts of equation for the growth rate. So here's just two comparisons. This is F16 and Gooby. And you can see, you know, that the, the, the 15 minutes between the images, they look pretty similar, but there seems to be some growth in the bubbles. Pretty cool, I think. Why do we think any of this stuff makes any sense? The MSP paid for a big CalVal effort, calibration and validation effort. So we have lots of ground site, not as much as I'd like, but we have some ground site stuff that convinces us it's right. We also have coincident imagery. So this is looking up the field lines. So it's sort of a sense, the same kind of, or the effective geometry projected in the space. And so you can see, ah, it looks pretty much the same. Coarser, of course, because we're doing this recovery. So we think we're seeing real stuff. And now some of the things we can do, we can build up climatologies. We can also start to look at these various slices and start to deduce things. Like it looks like, since there's no tilt in this bubble, because it looks like what happens is, depending on where the bubble is formed, it will sort of move at a different rate. The drift rate depends on where it's formed. And so in this particular case, there's no tilt, so it's recently formed. We can also look at things like the peak density, as I said before, and we get an estimate of what's happening on the bottom side. The bottom side gradient, of course, is the thing that drives the instability. So there's lots of things. What we'd like to then understand is, why do we see bubbles sometimes? Why do we not see them? Like in that one image that I showed you before, where we just look from either an hour apart or a day apart, why do they sometimes see them and why do you not? Still the big question. Okay, so one of the things we can do is we can change the geometry of the observer. This is a thing called Asriel, which you like to fly. This enables, you fly at like 400 kilometers, you can do 3D tomography of the ionosphere and the atmosphere, the neutral atmosphere. You get down to sub 10 kilometer resolution with this system. Okay. And that's what we would like to do. So you would be able to recover this structure. And one of the things I want to point out is that when we look at GPS radio occultation, one of the problems with GPS radio occultation is it does not give you a true electron density profile. Because 99% of the time, the observation and occultation is not in the plane of the observer. It's off to one side. So the arc of the observation of the, of the GPS uh, profile is over hundreds to thousands of kilometers. So all of the structure would be either missed or washed out. So um, this is sort of what the instrument looks like in this particular picture here. Um, so now I'm gonna show you a movie here, and I'm not sure I can run it from here, so I have to start this. So now I'm gonna show you some pictures of the aurora. And now usually in our community, we think, well, you know, if I'm gonna understand the aurora, I need to take pictures all the time, right? Now for the ITM community, lots of times, I just need to know what the inputs are. But so let's take a look. Here's some viz data. And you'll see every once in a while, there's Gooby data coming in through here. So it's a very brief movie. But so this is this coarse picture of what's going on. And then we get this really sharp picture. So that's the difference. You get a sharp, high resolution picture, native pixel resolution of about 10 kilometers, signal to noise ratio of about uh, 10 to 100 for a, a, a one erg aurora. And then, so we can start to build up a statistical picture of the small scale variability. Why do we want to do that? Because it's at the small scale so we get the really frontier work in terms of the dual heating, I think. So this is what one of these strip images looks like. You get it, I just think it's pretty. Um, but this is the kind of structure you see in the aurora from space and the far ultraviolet. Remember what we can do, because we get all these colors at the same time, each one of those guys can be produced or translated into E naught Q than the conductances, okay? So let's go to the next guy. So this is a kind of a sequence of pictures. Now this is just Goovy data from early on, but it's a nice movie, it gives you an idea. Now the limitation is you've got a swath, it's not as much vocal time as you'd like, but the instruments are fairly inexpensive. The Suzy Light instrument's about 10 kilograms, it takes about 10 watts, so it's relatively easy to accommodate. But you can start to see that if you had a couple of these guys, you can build up a pretty comprehensive picture of the Aurora. So let's go to the next guy here. Oh, so this is just one where, here's just two Susie images. They just happen to be within a few minutes of each other. And again, you can get most of the structure of the aurora oval. So the, the reason we do this is because we really don't have much in the way of comprehensive pictures. Go to the, Google, or the Susie website. 
You have KML files. You can plot different ones. This is one where I just slapped a couple of them together. But you can see up here, these are the products that you can overplot. Things like uh, the proton precipitation rate, the electron, the mean energy, and uh, the flux, and boundaries, and so on. So all of these things are available to you now. Um, now here's something I just wanted to show you. So what happens when you have four of these things flying at the same time? Four. So, not five, four. So here's, this is a way that, I don't know if it's probably impossible for a, a normal human to understand, but I'm going to try it anyway. <laughs> so remember, we're making these swaths, right? We're going around the Earth. We're going around the Earth, and we're making this little strip. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stack up one day's worth of data from one satellite, right? And so what I see, so this is the beginning of the day. So this is uh, an hour and, and a third of it, you know, about an hour and 20 minutes before the start of the day. This is Rev 2719, 9129.9. And this is, so here's the overall oval. You go across the equator, the overall oval, and then here's the equatorial arcs. So this is one orbit, and then um, you can see this is the UT down here on these guys here. So this is the end of the day. And here's the local solar time, 19 hours local solar time. And then this is the longitude of the day ascending node. So this is just a summary, right? So the real data are there. You would look at every one of these numbers. But so we see this. And so you can get an idea. As you go through, you can see all of a sudden, hey, something happened here. This is, again, that St. Patrick's Day storm that's recent, OK? You say, well, you know what I'd really like is I'd like to see more detail about what's going on in the aurora. Right? Well, what I can do is this is just four of these guys, four of these things, and they just took the strip images, and you can start to see all kinds of interesting things. So this is this is one day, and this is a little bit before the sort of the peak of the storm. And again, we're getting images of the aurora oval at about 10 kilometers resolution. The products we produce are coarser than that kilometers. But we're getting those every 20 minutes or so. Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Okay. And then we get, of course, the response of the neutral atmosphere and the ionosphere as well, including, and you can see here, that something really interesting happened to the equatorial arc. See how they're normally sort of well separated? They were coming along, everything's cool. And then the next day starts, whoa, they collapsed. And then they came back. Why is that? And they did it at all local times. So there's lots of questions about this. Now, this is what typically looks like one week's worth of data. So imagine this is like multidimensional. Okay? Now, again, you could look at the data. This is from the gallery page, susie.jhuapl.edu. There's an interesting, there's an interface, a KML interface. It's just fun to mess around with the images. You can navigate it. And then you can redo this so that you can easily identify what data you want to look at. And then the NetCDF files have all of the data numbers and all the products in them, too. So the KMZ files are just to mess around with. You can plot it, and you can zoom up on it like this and make pretty pictures, you know, and be the envy of all your neighbors. Okay, so now, what's the moral of all this? There's a lot of data here. Well, how do you, what do you do with it? Well, one of the things is, you know, in the spectrum of things, there's a physical quantity, the source of the signal properties and medium measurement system, and then the measured values. And you can do this either of two ways. You can either go forward modeling, where you start off with a physical quantity, and then you create, you know, you move through, like, say, if it's a number density, you know, what creates that signal that you're going to observe, like the photoelectron impact or recombination on the night set, the properties of the medium that dictate the transfer of radiation through the medium, and then your measurement system and the measured values. Or what you can do is you can do it as an inverse problem. That's traditionally the two ways we've done it. We've we used a forward model, we calculated, or we've done an inverse model and compared it to it. But one of the things we want to do is we want to make better use of the data that we have. And one of the things we can do is use these assimilative models. Now, the key thing that I think everybody in the community needs to understand is that when you take an incomplete measurement, so an incomplete measurement is something where you have to use other sources of information to deduce a physical quantity. And that could be either assumptions about cross-sections or densities or temperatures, whatever it is. If you use an assimilative model, then it can be a self-consistent. So what you do is the assimilative model takes in the measurements of the intensity, say, and it says, okay, if I measured, if I pretended I was a sensor flying through my assimilative model, 
and I had the exact same geometry you had, I would see this intensity. Is that higher or lower? Then from my understanding of what the covariance matrices are, that tells me what I have to change in my model, my assimilative model, to bring it into agreement. And that also allows you to uh, ameliorate the effects of calibration errors and so on. And so what we do is these the assimilative models sort of relax this constraint. And that means even small measurements, that's the key thing I wanted you to take away, that even small measurements are useful in our understanding. That means small satellites, ground-based, everything's useful. Well, again, you would have to, sorry? Oh, the question was, does, do my comments about assimilative models only apply to linear problems? I would say that a lot of the process that we use in models is we sort of linearize the solution of the problem. But um, the notion is to try to remove as many of those constraints as possible. And then, uh, so the point I wanted to make, and please don't think that I think that this is the only measurement one has to make, the UV measurements. It's part of this constellation. And what we need in the community is a robust program for making a variety of measurements and meshing those with the modeling community to figure out what we really do need to measure. That's the key thing. And it has to be driven not by just, hey, I have this thing that's my, like a tool on my tool belt. I know how to do this. It's like, what is the question you really want to ask? What are the fundamental questions that we have in front of us? And so CubeSats and ground-based measurements, all those are more valuable than ever before, in my opinion, when you have this assimilative technique, because it can help you understand how to do the first principles modeling. Where are your gaps in your knowledge? There's another technique called the um, observing simulation Observing sensor simulation experiments where you decide how many sensors you need, what are their distributions, what do they need to look like, and so on. And so I, I think that this is really a key idea. It's essential to progress in a cost-constrained environment because what happens sometimes when I talk to people at headquarters, they have the Grabowski diagram, that little picture with all the processes in it in mind, and they say, how can you ever make sense of this without measuring everything? We can't afford that. We're going to do something different. And so the key thing is we can identify science questions and bring them to closure. Okay, so um, you know I think that that this also would get us to the point of making these taking advantage of new technologies and doing this predictive capabilities where we really want to go. So what I wanted to show you is just two two more movies, and this is a, an example of what one of these models looks like. This is Gary Bust's Ida 4D. And uh, what, what's going on here is you see the evolution of the ionosphere. This is a, the day-night boundary here. And what you're seeing is the gray is SUSY data incorporated, GPS radio occultation. The squares here are GPS TEC measurements from the ground. There's a, every once in a while you'll see a streak that's JSON uh, or TOPEX data coming in. And so the notion is that we can now drive these things in near real time or even faster. Now, what would I like to do? Well, so here's the question. We'd like to understand, remember I said we were going to understand the coupling to the magnetosphere? So what we're going to see here is this is, um, this is ampere data, uh, magnetometer data that's in, for incurrence based on a uh, uh, flight of iridium. This is uh, supergarn data. And then there's little arrows here with supermag. And if you look carefully, every once in a while the SUSY data comes in. And this was just two SUSYs. Comes in and you'll see the, um, the things so the the... Uh, sort of weather flag indicator kind of thing that's super mag. You can see it respond. Let's see if I can figure out where the mouse went. There. And if you look real closely here, you see how these guys, like, which one are we get a swap through here? See, this, this is responding, and then we get a look at this, and you can see they're lined up. And then, so we can start to build a picture. Now, how would you do a model comparison with this. That's again the notion of the assimilative model. So we have two threads that we want to develop in the community. The assimilative model to sort of take in as much data as we can to help us focus our efforts. And then the first principles models because we really want to understand the physics. Now, um, let's go to the next guy. So, now, of course, that's only half of the problem. This is the same time period. This is the South Pole. And you can see the limitation of the South Pole. There's just not as many ground sites, of course. That's the problem with ground-based observations. they got to have ground. 
and they're looking at the wrong direction for the auroral oval, which is offset. But notice here with Susie's come in, and again, they're giving you information about the conductance pattern, energetics, the precipitating particles. Again, we only have two in this particular movie. But I think that's sort of an indication of the kind of challenges we have. Like I said before, we got a solution that's smaller, more capable, uh, cheaper. This is something we're looking at. We built the TRLs at six. I think the key thing here is that this tool that I've tried to show you a little bit about has evolved over the last half century. All the techniques are well understood. The physics is pretty well understood, I think. But now the time is to bring the communities together to meld this data. I've got a lot of data. Everybody's welcome to it. It's on that website. The only thing I'd ask is that, um, you know, please, you know, they're, you know, talk to us about using the data. Um, and a lot of the stuff was done in collaboration with CPI and Aerospace years ago uh, to produce the, uh, well, to do the CalVal. And the CalVal, in fact, is, undergo is still going on. Uh, there's extensive validation that has been carried out. The SUSE website, no money from NASA, no money from NSF. So far, DMSP has been paying for it in support of the CalVal effort. Um, and then, as I said, all of the data products and there are dozens of them have error bars or error estimates on it and quality flags. But um, you should know what, how good the data is. But remember, the thing about these instruments is they're individuals. Like people, they have their own little quirks and traits that sometimes can lead you astray. So, you know, if you'd like to work with it, I'd, be, I'd love to talk to you about it more. I'm just try to give you an introduction to this because this community might not work with data quite as much. Um, and I hope we can figure out some ways to collaborate. Thank you. Um, nice talk, Larry. So um, the, uh, uh, the images at higher latitudes presumably are due to electron precipitation in contrast so, with the, the solar photons? Yeah, so actually if we, um, and I'm just to I can go back and show one of these guys. So what we see when we see one of these typical images, and I tried to just sort of randomly pick them, um, and get it, and then tilt the KMZ file so it looks pretty. Um, now, this is night side, that's why the disk here is black. But what normally happens is you'll see um, electron precipitation, and if you pick this guy here, you can see where there's proton precipitation as well. Now, one of the challenges that we had was on the day side, you're quite correct, there's solar photons coming in and illuminating the atmosphere, so there is what we call a day glow removal algorithm. And that has to be taken off. And so that's sort of why I'd say, you know, if we were to really do this, the best way is in a sense to figure out uh, what does the model say the day glow contribution should be and the overall precipitation tendency, does it look right? Is it higher or lower and that kind of thing? That's the advantage of the assimilative technique because I have to make assumptions because there's a model uh, atmosphere that's involved in this. But we, we sort of assume that, you know, through here, for example, if this was a sunlit scene, that um, there's almost like a statistical mean behavior of the atmosphere so we can understand how bright it is as a function of solar zenith angle and latitude and take that out. And we try to estimate that, by the way, in the error bars, what the error is in the removal of the day glow. Okay. Um, and so the actually the main question I wanted to ask, I want to make sure I was on the okay. right track here. Um, so uh, given the high, the high rate FUV instruments that have been flown, much higher resolution, and estimates have been made of the precipitating electron power from coarser resolutions. I'm just wondering if you has anybody tried to compare uh, the precipitating power that you see when you're looking at this kind of structure in that same field of view? Say, limit the field of view from uh, from an FUV instrument on image, for example, and um, compare it with this. Any sense of what those differences look like? Yeah, so um, there are two different lines of thought, I mean, two different things I want to say about that. The first is um, wind bangs here, right? Uh, and there, sorry. <laughs> you use our goofy model of the precipitation characteristics. And one of the things we see is we, we put more energy into the high latitudes, which makes the models happy. Okay? And, and the other thing is that um, I think what you're, what I would say is that this is getting at the fundamental question because it's always this question of like, 
what's the average of the, how do you average conductance over a big pixel versus a small one? And you know, what are the essential scales? Because of course you, you want to know what the smaller scale variability in the conductance in the electric fields is, because it's the product of those, the average of the product of those guys, not the average the product of the average of those guys that makes the difference. And it does look like it makes a difference. We need to do more work on that. And and this consumes a lot of time. So I there's lots of things I would like to do, but I just don't have time for it. If you're interested, I'd love to have some people work on that. But it is a fundamental question. It does make a big difference. In fact, one more thing I was going to say is that um, I think Jeff and I did a, looked at this years ago. And I don't know if we ever brought it to fruition. But remember, I looked at the... Uh, the conductance estimates at small scales versus larger scales, and they're off by at least a factor of three. If you take the average versus the individual, you know, sum it up over, um, if I pretended like my resolution was lower, which I think was what your question, I think I got about a factor of three difference. But if I published all the papers I ever started and got halfway through, so my career wouldn't be in the, oh, no, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah. Thank you for a beautiful talk uh, on, the, on a very complex uh, piece of work. Uh, and uh, I'm not anywhere close to uh, fully understand how your data reduction uh, works. Uh, oh, I wanted to mention, before I ask my question, I wanted to mention the other thing. I'm, I'm very pleased to see that you are aware on how the context of our field is changing with the extrasolar planets uh, and, and uh, the whole uh, new horizon on uh, uh, data of stars interacting with planets in habitable zones and what have you. Uh, I think I'm very glad that, that in your field there is this awareness. Um, my question is the following. If, if I understood your presentation correctly, you showed these four columns uh, of uh, what your four instruments saw uh, passing uh, through different solar times looking at sort of the same storm. Yes. Now, what, are, what could be difficult about that? I'm they are, joking because that's really a complicated picture. The, I, the uh, relative calibration and noise level uh, has to be different. I understand that. But in principle, shouldn't it be possible to put all of these on top of one another and have a much smoother picture in time? Yes, you're absolutely right. And that's one of those things that's on my list of, to do. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's just a limitation of the amount of time and money. And, but you're quite right. And we, one of the things we spend a lot of time on is, you, well, you know the old story about a, a person with one watch always knows what time it is, and a person with two watches has not, no idea. Imagine with four watches. And so we're always struggling with is trying to make sure that those four instruments are sort of the same thing. And the problem is, there's always this difference in the time that they cross. And of course, they cross orbits at high latitudes where there's a lot of variability. It's a very complicated problem. But you're quite right. What I would like to do is put them on sort of a movie. And this was one of my to-do list things. I just didn't get to it. But thank you. Yes, I enjoyed your talk very much. I'm, I'm not an atmospheric, I'm a solar person. So uh, I, would, I would like to ask, though, um, as someone that observed the sun remotely, uh, you know, we, we face from one position, uh, namely the Earth, sometimes we get other spacecraft, we have very particular problems, um, which you, you fully understand, obviously. I mean, you know, non uniqueness issues and what have you. <clears throat> which you, you, you address here, and, and it seems as if the understanding of the ionosphere is actually rather mature. So I, in, in, in the sense of, you know, you know what the energy input is primarily. Under disturbed conditions, you also know what the energy input comes from, even if you don't understand the mechanism itself. So my question for you is, um, 
aside from the obvious applications where people die if you can't communicate, what are the real basic fundamental physical problems that, that are really challenging about the ionosphere that make it really worth a lot of money and investment and time, as say compared to understanding other plasmas in the universe? Well, that's a question I think the whole community is faced with, and, and part of it is communicating the value of this as, as an intellectual enterprise. So what I would say is that there's a couple of reasons why. The first is that this is a natural laboratory for our understanding of the fundamental processes that occur throughout the universe. And in this particular problem, when I'm looking at the ionosphere, it's the details of the plasma neutral coupling. Because what's happening is that, and it, I only hinted at a few of these things, but this, this, say this O to N2 ratio, this change in the composition of the neutrals, that, that storm front that you see move down as it's, impul it's pulsed by this high latitude forcing, that's impeded by the collisions with the ions because it's, they're try it's trying to push these guys up along field lines. And so there's a resistance there. Do we get that right? Well, that's one of the questions I said. Do we get the boundaries right? Do we understand that? We think we understand the physics on the, on the microscopic scale, but it's on the macroscopic scale that's the challenge. Then there's the, this whole plasma instability problem. When I mentioned this thing about the bubbles, what we don't understand is we, like we can write down the, the growth rate. We understand the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. We think we know, you know when the conditions are right, but we're still not able to predict when the bubbles occur. So there's something that we're missing. It seems like there's, you know, we sort of know everything about the ionosphere except why these bubbles occur. Are they seeded from below? So this is another problem that couples the forcing from below these, you know, um, uh, like tropospheric storms, for example, can create waves that propagate upward, and they may provide small wave-like perturbations that then grow without bound. Why don't you see them all the time? Why does sometimes it appear that they're shut down by auroral activity? Is it because this is a complete coupled, tied together system? So those are the kind of riddles. And so what we've got is, so when we talk about things, I think the frontier for us all is understanding our place in the universe. Exoplanets, we have two examples, Venus and Mars that are very much like the Earth, but they're uninhabitable. They, they probably, occur, you know, their evolutionary processes are pretty much the same. But what's the difference? No magnetic field. Is that essential to the, uh, to a sort of a stable uh, living condition? I don't know. But the question we have then is we have this natural laboratory that's right here and accessible to us, and it's becoming more and more accessible with commercial suborbital. So I'd say that that's, that's why we want to do it. We want to understand the basic processes that are in the universe, and we want to understand, um, you know, in our natural laboratory how we can do this, because the scale lengths here are quite a bit larger than we could do in a typical laboratory setup. And then we may think we know how to model it, but still the models have a lot of fundamental physics that's parameterized. For example, in the lower atmosphere is well mixed, and then at about 105, 110 kilometers is the area called the turbo pause, where we transition from well mixed to sort of diffusively separated. We have parameters like the eddy mixing coefficient that we use to model that parameter, that breakdown through turbulent process and deposition of energy. Do we get that right? Do we really understand those processes? And then there are all kinds of plasma stuff that I don't understand at all that I'm sure people here can tell you more about. But those are the kind of things we'd like to unravel. That answered sort of. Yeah, I think I remember that the one movie you were trying to show last week and it didn't work here. And I'm so glad Hanley invited you back so we can see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, in the movie, you have a two uh, SUSE instrument in there. You, as you remember, you, you said you have four available. If you put a four in there, it would be much of you, I think. Oh, well, in this particular case was one that um, one of my guys, Rob Barnes, <laughs> who uh, works on uh, Van Allen probes, he was making a movie for somebody else. And so I said, hey, can you see if you can put SUSE in there? And, I, and he said, okay, well, I was doing it for 2010. So, well, we got two in 2010, so that's why there's two. And because I don't have any money, that's why that's the movie I showed you. Great answer, right? And no commercials. I'm hitchhiking you know back to, Boulder, I mean, to Baltimore, by the way. Anybody going that way? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. But 
you know, this is one of the questions is when you increase the revisit time and you get this finer scale picture, going back to Bill's question, you know, how much of a difference does it make in the high latitude drivers and how much does that make in terms of the response? And those are the kind of questions I think we, we can start to answer. And one of the things I wanted to get the modeling community involved in is let's see if there's a tendency, and this is not meant in a bad way, it's a human thing. When you show your results or your models to data, right? They always agree, right? And I've heard people at headquarters go, the answer, you, you understand it. What's left? The model agrees with the observations. Well, maybe you just showed observations over Millstone Hill, you know? Okay, but what are the unknowns? What are the things you don't understand? What are the things we need to understand? Because otherwise they're going to just check, they're putting a check in the box, Heliophysics doesn't need any more money. Let's move on. Um. Thank you, Larry, again. Thanks.